Welcome to the Benning Report. Coming up in this edition, we preview this year's Best Ranger competition. And tankers cross-train on strikers. Later, Soldier for Life supports transitioning soldiers. Welcome to the Benning Report. I'm Melissa Bell. And I'm Katie Cook with the Fort Benning Public Affairs Office. Thanks for watching. Recently, Fort Benning Emergency Services and other directorates tested the installation's readiness in emergency situations during the annual force protection exercise. The safety and welfare of our soldiers, civilians, their families, and our community is a top priority. Working together with law enforcement and emergency response partners from the local community, first responders were put through their paces recently during Fort Benning's annual force protection exercise. The day began early with a simulated active shooter at the Benning Road gate, leading to a temporary closing of all access points. Well, in accordance with uh, both Department of Defense and the Department of the Army regulations, each installation is required to execute an annual uh, exercise to test and validate installation response, consequence management, and recovery procedures, as well as plans and policies to ensure that they address the uh, scenarios that may arise. The training exercise then moved to the old Martin Army Hospital, where emergency responders were faced with a scenario involving multiple casualties, a car bomb, and a hostage situation on the third floor. Personnel were evaluated on making the initial calls, situation assessment, and movements to ensure safety throughout the installation. As the force protection exercise continued, the Public Affairs Office was activated as well, testing their ability to gather and disseminate timely information. This included staging a press conference for Garrison Command Sergeant Major Kevin Floyd. It's our job to communicate information as accurately and quickly as possible. And exercises such as this allow us to test our own systems and our response times in such scenarios as this one. And while all relevant departments on Fort Benning maintain their force protection training, we should all remain aware of our surroundings and not hesitate to notify law enforcement of any suspicious behavior or unattended items. David Wright, Fort Benning TV. Fort Benning's 98th Training Division provides America well-trained citizen soldiers ready to meet any mission. During the unit's nearly 80-year history, they've served during mobilization and wartime operations, gone through various reorganizations, restructuring, and mission changes. And now, there's a new top NCO to help see this mission through. Soldiers, family, and friends welcome Command Sergeant Major Robert Priest during a ceremony on Fort Benning's Brave Rifles Field. Command Sergeant Major Priest entered the U.S. Army Reserve after completing a five-year assignment as an active duty Marine infantryman. With 30 years of active and reserve experience combined, he brings a wealth of experience to his new job. A lot of times soldiers get hung up in just one sort of job, but Command Sergeant Major Priest mixed it up and he just had a breadth of experience that brings to the table to me an understanding of the Army Reserve, how the Army runs, as well as understanding all the different soldiers that we have because our drill sergeants have all different MOSs. Command Sergeant Major Priest has served in various senior leadership positions. Most recently as Brigade Command Sergeant Major for the 34 Civil Affairs and as a drill sergeant, an assignment that not only gives his direct knowledge of the 98th mission, but also influence one of his goals for this assignment, a focus on PT. Command Sergeant Major Priest is planning to take physical fitness to a whole new level for these reserve soldiers. If a soldier is physically fit, that impacts their emotional stability, the way they think about things, if they think, look, act like a soldier, that begins with physical fitness. And oh, by the way, that's important in combat. You gotta be able to carry your rucksack, you gotta be able to shoot, you gotta be able to move in, in diverse environments. The unit bids farewell to Command Sergeant Major Grady Blue, whose new assignment is taking responsibility of the 311th Expeditionary Sustainment Command in Los Angeles, California. <laughs> Katie Cook, Fort Benning, TV. The Executive Leadership Development Program recently brought more than 60 high-speed Department of Defense, interagency civilians, and active duty personnel to Fort Benning to learn how the Army trains its infantry and armor soldiers and leaders. 
ELDP is a year-long Department of Defense program that provides future leaders the knowledge and understanding to make informed decisions. The Executive Leadership Development Program immersed its participants in experiences throughout the Department of Defense, giving them an understanding of the scope of military missions and showing them how those missions impact their own jobs. Does it impact the budget that I do? Does it impact the budget that I'm supporting that ultimately supports this unit? We look at the skill sets that they're trying to impart upon us, but then we have to go home and translate how does it apply to my job at home? During their week-long stay at Fort Benning, participants were exposed to Army training, from tower repelling to detecting IEDs, where soldiers showed ELDP leaders how to scout out IEDs in unfamiliar territory. I mean, there's quite a bit we can learn from our textbooks and sitting in classrooms, but if you really want to understand of our military, what better way to learn than to go through some of the, I think, challenges that our military goes on. It gives us a better feel of our, of our own soldiers, sailors, and airmen if we come out and experience it firsthand. This training gives these high potential leaders a bird's eye view into the DOD, focusing on specific competencies needed to lead teams, projects, and people. It exposes you to some things that you would not experience on a daily basis. It pushes you as a leader. Um, it highlights some of your strengths and it also highlights some of your weaknesses so you uh, can understand what you might need to work on as a leader and take that back to your home station. Being exposed to training of all the military branches allows these leaders to visually see how vital it is that all services work together as a joint force. It just helped make me understand how important it is that we understand how we complement each other so that when we do have to take care of a problem or even help somebody out, that we deploy the proper strengths and, and uh, feed on those strengths. ELDP's next deployment will be in April, when they travel to San Antonio to train with the Department of Homeland Security Border Patrol. Katie Cook, Fort Benning TV. It's one of the toughest and most physically demanding competitions in the Army, and it's held right here at Fort Benning. David Wright is out at the Airborne and Ranger Training Brigade to find out what we can expect from this year's Best Ranger competition, just a few weeks away. David? Okay, thank you very much. I'm out here right now at the Airborne Ranger Training Brigade. I'm with Brigade Commander Colonel David Fivecoat, and we're here to talk about the 2015 Best Ranger competition. Colonel, thank you for joining me today. What can you tell us about this year's competition? Well, this year, the Airborne Ranger Training Brigade is going to host the 32nd Annual Lieutenant General David E. Grange Best Ranger Competition. The competition pits 50 two-man Ranger qualified teams against one another in a series of physical, mental, and tactical tasks over about a 60-hour period over a weekend. Over the weekend, the competitors will walk about 100 miles, do a parachute jump, do a helo cast, climb a couple obstacle courses, and do a couple other mystery events that they'll only uh, get to find out when they come out here. Well, that sounds pretty tough. Who's going to be coming out competing? Where, where, where are the teams coming from? And can you get into maybe a little bit of the, the history of the competition? We've ran this uh, competition for 32 years. It first started out in 1982. Last year, uh, Lieutenants uh, Rose and Bergman from the 25th Infantry Division uh, won the competition. This year, we got a great lineup of 50 teams. There's going to be teams representing the 75th Ranger Regiment, the 82nd Airborne Division, 101st Airborne Division, 10th Mountain Division, 25th National Guard, couple of special forces groups and of course the Airborne and Ranger Training Brigade. I know you'd like to have spectators come out and visit. If they want to come out and watch, what's the best thing they can do? Well Dave, we've got a couple of great events that spectators can come out and watch. The first is the opening event which starts at 0600 on Friday right out here at Camp Rogers when Lieutenant General David Grange will fire the ceremonial pistol to kick off the event. For other spectators we recommend coming out on Saturday over to Todd Field which is just uh, about a mile past uh, Camp Rogers. There's about six events that are ongoing that day. It's really great for spectators to watch. They can move easily between the events. Uh, plus folks are out there selling refreshments and it turns out to be a real good time for the spectators. Well, very good. Now I understand at the end of this there'll be an award ceremony. If people want to see that, can you give us some details on that? Yeah, the, uh, the award ceremony is going to be at 10 o'clock on uh, Monday, April 13th at Marshall Auditorium in McGinnis Wickham Hall, which is there on Main Post. This year's guest speaker is Sergeant Major of the Army, Dan Daly, and he'll present uh, the traditional Colt pistols to the two winners that will be crowned after the 60-hour competition. Thank you very much. That sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun, as it is every year. The Best Ranger competition, again, will be held April 10th through the 12th, 
And if you'd like more information, you can go to the Benning homepage at benning.army.mil. And with Colonel Five Coat, I'm David Wright with Fort Benning Television. Back to you in the studio. Coming up next, we go inside level two of the Army's new Master Marksmanship training course. While strikers can be configured in multiple ways, their primary missions are to serve as infantry carrier vehicles and mobile gun systems. The Striker MGS driving course here provides the training required to operate these key assets. Strikers were originally developed to fill the capability void between light infantry units deploying within 18 hours and heavy mechanized units. They are designed to deploy within 96 hours and support early ground forces until more robust assets can arrive. Whereas tactical use is an infantry support vehicle, we go out, we uh, support the infantry when needed. We do escorts or missions and stuff like that. Strikers are built in a variety of configurations, granting the vehicle operational mobility and flexibility to cover a range of tactical needs. This is a Striker Mobile Gun System, or MGS, and before they can be leveraged effectively in the field, there first must be soldiers trained to drive them. The 1st Battalion of the 29th Infantry Regiment is charged with producing those drivers, many of which are 19 kilos, or tank crewmen, seeking to open up more military occupational specialties for their careers. Any soldier that, you know, gets cross-trained and it, they're worth more to the Army, it's worth its weight in gold. Following the crawl, walk, run model, day one's crawl phase consists of placing each student in the MGS driver's seat and orienting them to the controls. Unlike tanks, it features a steering wheel and handles very similar to a truck. If you're ever coming down a hill and your driver's having problems, they can always flip that switch and the engine will help you brake also. For day two's walk phase, students mounted up in simulators, giving them a chance to safely acclimate to the handling of the vehicle as they run through simulations of the driver course they will see the next day. We want these drivers to work out their bugs and kinks here at the simulators before actually driving on the uh, driving course tomorrow in order to prevent damage to our vehicles and equipment. Then it all culminates on day three, driving day. Today's students are out here learning to drive the Striker MGS vehicle. They came out and took what they learned from Friday and negotiated the course. The MGS is manned by a three-man crew of commander, driver, and gunner using commands very similar to tank crews. Today, students rotate through each of the crew positions, giving each a turn behind the wheel. They leave this course with knowledge of the Stryker MGS and the ability to drive it, but they must return to their units and undergo a driver's training course there in order to receive their license. David Wright, Fort Benning TV. Soldiers in the Master Marksmanship Training Course have finished Level 1 of Basic Rifle Marksmanship and are taking the fundamentals they've learned to the next step. Let's take a look at Level 2 where they'll prove they have the skills to perform at 50 meters or less. With the basics behind them, soldiers in the Master Marksmanship Training Course are moving on to Short Range Marksmanship, which will test speed versus accuracy, weapons manipulation, dynamic movement, reloads, and clearing malfunctions. Not only will they learn this vital information, they'll learn to teach it as well, all while using a push-pull methodology. We'll speed them up, and then the actually starts to fall off, and we'll pull them back. So they can actually start to pick up, hey, what amount of energy do I need to put into this shot? The whole thing coming out of short range marksmanship is I'm only going to give each shot the amount of energy needed to make the hit I want. To begin level two, soldiers use the M9 Beretta, a tool to supplement training and enhance basic rifle marksmanship as they eventually move on to the M4. For any guy that's ever picked up a pistol, it is about the hardest weapon system to master. It requires two things and two things hard, side alignment and trigger control. So we use it as a way to introduce them to pistol and then on the back side of it, it becomes an enhancing uh, capability to teach rifle marksmanship. What we see is that short sight radius uh, will magnify any errors they have in side alignment uh, and trigger control. And so once we can master it on a short sight radius, once we get them on that rifle, uh, it'd be that much easier. Even though soldiers are shooting up close and personal at targets, sometimes within five meters, it's the goal of this course to get them to visualize the importance of the scenarios. 
Where it really becomes applicable is when that student starts visualizing it. Hey, this is actually a room. This is actually a person. I'm under fire. I'm under duress, not because of a buzzer or I'm going to fail the course, but because someone's going to take my life if I don't take theirs. They want you to be accountable for every round. Yeah, you hit the target, but where at on that target? Did he mobilize the target? Is, did you hit a switch where he's completely incapacitated? Or is that target still going to be able to fight after you put those rounds down range? In the short range marksmanship realm, time is measured in milliseconds, and milliseconds equals life. You know, the faster I can engage targets, the higher my rate of survivability is going to be. This weapon system is going to keep you alive when your main weapon system goes down, right? It's the goal of this course to make sure that every soldier who graduates can not only perform these tasks, but can teach them as well. Sending these vital skills back throughout the force. Melissa Bell, Fort Benning TV. After the break, Soldier for Life supports transitioning soldiers. For soldiers preparing to transition out of the Army, the idea of life as a civilian can be daunting. How can they successfully begin a new career? What if they need to earn their degree and how can they meet hiring managers at leading companies? None of these have to be difficult. The Army believes once a soldier, a soldier for life. And it is taking the steps to ensure smooth transitions for soldiers and families. Deputy Secretary of Labor Christopher Liu visited Fort Benning in support of the Soldier for Life Transition Summit where the Army's commitment to help soldiers and veterans succeed in the civilian sector was on full display. One of the challenges is to help service members not only understand how to translate the skills that they have uh, achieved in military service to the civilian world, but how to connect themselves with employers. Here, over 100 employers gathered for two days of workshops and a hiring expo. The event, a joint venture between the Army, Department of Defense, Veterans Administration, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and Hiring Our Heroes was aimed at creating connections to employers committed to hiring soldiers, veterans, and spouses, even possibly hiring them on the spot. All these employers that are here, uh, they know the value that a veteran brings to their organization, so they're here, uh, they want to hire veterans, they want to attract them to their companies in their locale. Every soldier should be preparing for his or her future outside of the Army even if they have no immediate plans to separate. Soldier for Life knows this and will bring the Transition Summit to 18 different installations this year in an effort to inform and equip as many soldiers as possible. Everything we've done in the military is we've trained to go to war and be as proficient as possible. I think you gotta kinda attack the transition program like that. Master all of those opportunities that you have, take full advantage of them, and use them if you need them. If you don't, great, hopefully you find employment. The Army also offers career skills programs, training opportunities in career fields for soldiers in their last six months of service. And while the career skills programs are still ramping up at installations across the country, one is already in place here. We have some pilots going on across the country. Uh, right here at Fort Benning, they have a commercial driver's license academy going on. Soldiers can participate in that and they would walk away with a, a connection to uh, any a truck driving job in the logistics field. Making the transition from military to civilian life can be a frightening prospect for some, but the resources are available to help soldiers in any way. From completing one's education to perfecting one's job interview skills, Soldier for Life is there to help. Knowing that it is Soldier for Life and not Soldier for Right Now, 
or soldier for transition that I can come back at any time and get assistance with resume writing, job searches. That is something of a safety net when, you, when you're transitioning out. For the full 2015 schedule of transition summits, visit hiringourheroes.org. David Wright, Fort Benning TV. While some soldiers see career opportunities with leading companies in the civilian sector, others are looking to start their own business. The team of experts from American Dream University visited Fort Benning to help soldiers become their own boss. This was a couple of days packed full of information for soldiers leaving the military. American Dream University is an organization that spent two days at Fort Benning, first by learning what soldiers do by doing it themselves. This is a ton of fun, man. I mean, that's just today. I mean, we've done the Ranger obstacle course. We've eaten with some Rangers. We've asked them all about stuff. We've uh, we jumped off a 34-foot tower. They're doing rappelling right behind me. I mean, it's been an absolutely phenomenal and amazing experience. You know, these guys speak all the time, and they have businesses, right? But they never get to really meet the audience before they speak to them. So spend the day with soldiers and asking them questions, right? You know, what are you looking to do after you get out of the Army? A lot of them don't have an idea what they want to do, so I think it makes it more meaningful to them. If someone wants to go to college or find their next dream job or start a business, you know, we want to make the transition a success, right? Founder Phil Rendezzo puts successful business people on stage, talking directly to soldiers about their future out of uniform. We're really here to give back and serve because we're here to basically help empower, inspire, and educate uh, people that are transitioning back into civilian life. On stage, filmmaker Nick Nanton from Miami is talking about a veteran he hired. And he got a degree in sales and marketing. He then uh, enlisted in the reserves. He did a tour in Iraq as a lead machine gunner. And then he decided he wanted to go to seminary when he got out. I'm like, you're like the most fascinating person I've ever met. I don't know what I'm going to do with you, but I will figure it out. He's now, he's been working for me about six months. He went from, he was making like $8.50 an hour doing lawn service before. He's now making about $11,000 a month selling for me. You know why? Because the key to sales are two things. Be interested in others and be interesting. Before you guys are trying to match your skills. Hey, what are my skills? What are your skills? How many of you got whatever it takes? That's your skills, man. These speakers are anxious and willing to help soldiers make a successful transition to a civilian career. If you'd like to follow up, connect with them via the website at AmericanDreamU.org. Bob Kaiser, Fort Benning TV. Coming up next, the Infantry Chapel celebrates a milestone anniversary. It's a historic place on Fort Benning built in 1934 and once appeared in Ripley's Believe It or Not. Can you name this building? It's the Infantry Chapel and it's celebrating 80 years of service to the Fort Benning community. From Carillon's to worship and weddings, the Infantry Chapel has been a Fort Benning icon. And this Easter marks 80 years of service to the community. When it first opened, it was called the Three Faiths Chapel because it served Jewish, Catholic, and Protestant communities here on the post. Within just a few years, it expanded to serve five denominations, so we changed the name. Now it's the Infantry Center Chapel. We call it TIC Chapel. Shortly after opening, Ripley's Believe It or Not found out about the chapel, and in the 1940s, it was listed for serving the most faiths of any chapel in the country. Modeled after the first Presbyterian church in Savannah, this elegant chapel with its 100-foot steeple serves as a popular wedding destination, especially in the 1950s. This was the most popular church or chapel in the Chattahoochee Valley for weddings. We had on average three a week, 15 a month, which was, you know, turning them over very, very quickly. And one feature that has recently returned to the community are the carillons, donated by Harvey Firestone Jr. as a tribute to the American soldiers who died in World War II, and silence for a commanding general's ailing wife. It didn't take long for, for birds to roost in there and then lightning struck, and, and we were without our carillons for many years until 2010. I think it's just fabulous that we're enjoying them again every hour. With many people flocking to the chapel for events, tours, and occasions, this is one Fort Benning destination not to be missed. Melissa Bell, Fort Benning TV. You know, that's really a beautiful chapel. Katie, it really is. You know, there was a time when the chapel was holding an average of 15 weddings a month. I really like the carillons. And it's funny you should say that because people used to come in from Columbus just to hear the daily 30-minute concert. 
Well, that'll bring this edition of the Benning Report to an end. But you can watch these stories and others on youtube.com slash TV or at benning.army.mil. And you can also like us on Facebook. From the Public Affairs Office, thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.